So namaste. Thank you for this uh, warm introduction. I'll also thank you for having me here. I need to thank uh, Swami Bhumananda Tirtha, Swami Nirvishishananda Tirtha and Maguru Priya for generously inviting me for this global convention. I was quite surprised to be invited on a Gita convention when I am absolutely no expert on the Gita. Uh, you can see that I'm a medical doctor and uh, my encounter with the Gita, although it was quite a few years ago, has not been that easy at the beginning. And if I want to share, you know, how it all started, uh, I must, you have to put me in my context of being a young uh, French um, medical student. And uh, in my twenties, I had heard about India just a little bit, but I knew nothing about its philosophy or the traditions in India. And when I picked the Bhagavad Gita, I picked a small book in French. I think if I remember well, it was uh, translated by, uh, uh, you know, someone in Sri Aurobindo's ashram. And uh, it was a very pretty little book, but the first encounter was a little bit difficult for me. Imagine myself with a Christian upbringing and a very rational mind. And, you know, my um, values were really about uh, love and love your neighbors. And here comes the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita with Lord Krishna. I had her heard, you know, that Krishna is a special, uh, wise person. And Arjuna, I knew nothing about Arjuna. But uh, I immediately sided with Arjuna and felt, yes, he's bringing so many good arguments, you know, why should he fight this war? And, uh, you know, he's so brilliant, the mind is so intelligent that whatever argument he brings, you know, when he says, I would prefer to lose that argument than to kill my family, my relatives, my teachers. I completely felt, you know, like I don't see how, where this book is going to take me and how ever I'm going to be agreeing on, uh, you know, uh, looking at um, a possible war, like something, uh, you know, that is your duty. So that was my first encounter with the Bhagavad Gita with really something very difficult to accept and wondering how is this book so important for so many people around the world? I knew, you know, I knew about the Gita from my friends uh, uh, in France and not from, uh, I had, I don't think I had never really met anybody from India at that time. So here am I with this book and the first chapter that's uh, getting me quite confused. And uh, after now a few years of exploring further, I must say that I think I was pretty much in the same state of confusion that uh, Arjuna was on this battlefield. Completely related, you know, I could relate to his state of mind. So this uh, despondency of Arjuna uh, is very, very close to what I have felt time and again in my own uh, life, you know, uh, how you can feel sometimes that your mind is giving you so many good arguments and, uh, uh, you know, can bring elements to convince you about something. And yet inside there's something else that tells you this is not so simple. There's something else bigger that I have to do. Uh, what is really my duty here? And then it brings a lot of confusion. So, uh, uh, you know, looking at the Bhagavad Gita in this context, I read the entire book, but I don't think I grasped much on the first reading. And it took me much more years to be able to really understand the depth of this book. So how did that happen? How did this transformation happen? I would say, you know, at the same time, uh, so I was in my early 20s, uh, as I said at the beginning, and I started a meditation practice at the same time. It's called heartfulness, and it has three elements. One element in the morning of meditation that kind of grounds you, uh, you know, have a conversation with your inner self and kind of silence the voice of the head and be able to listen inside. It has a practice 
in the evening that allows to actually clear the confusion, clear the emotional charge of the day and make you extremely clear in your mind, you know, and the more you practice, the clearer you get. And then in the evening, it has a night connection that is in the form of a prayer that was also a, a bit close to how I had been uh, raised, you know, doing a prayer at night uh, as a kid. So that was quite convenient for me. What I liked with, it practice, with this practice is that it was practical. And I was doing something for myself every day that would connect me with myself and the deeper question that I had. And this is really what, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita brought to me. Once I read again, you know, after maybe a few years of meditation, I don't know, because I read Bhagavad Gita several times since, uh, you know, this first encounter. And uh, I must say that uh, each time I pick the book and each time I read, even if it's not the full book, I learn something new. So the one of the most impactful uh, message that was there right from the second chapter, uh, right from, you know, uh, uh, the first teaching of Lord Krishna to Arjuna is this idea of the uh, immortal self within us. So I had heard about the idea of reincarnation, which is not very familiar in my upbringing. Uh, and uh, for me, it was like, okay, why not? You know, maybe there is there are other lives, but what I have to do is with this life. So I don't really have to bother about was there life before, is there life after, but I have to do something with this life. What's my purpose? What's my duty? Why am I here? That was a big, big troubling question, you know, that sometimes even made me feel extremely sad inside because I didn't find a proper answer and nobody around me actually could bring me a proper answer. So the Bhagavad Gita brought that and especially Lord Krishna explaining to Arjuna that what you're doing in this life matters because you have a bigger purpose in the scale, you know, of the universe. And your purpose is to follow, you know, what you have to do, your duty in this life, knowing that the self of you and the others in the play is beyond what is happening right now. What is happening right now is a resolution of what was before and what needs to be tomorrow. And when you see life with that new concept, you know, that piece of the puzzle that was missing for me, it completely opens to a new um, possibility that, okay, when I wake up, there is actually something that brought me here for a specific purpose. And I need to get to know that purpose. Here again, you know, the second thing that was very important for, uh, for me while uh, uh, listening, I would say, to Lord Krishna's advice is to understand that um, what is my duty here is to excel in what I'm doing. So you will see that Lord Krishna actually starts with the yoga of action, you know, which was, was perfect for me because I was completely in action. I think we are all much more in action than in knowledge, you know, maybe in the olden times we were in knowledge, now we are all in action. So to pick us up from the battlefield, from the moment where you have to make a choice and make an action uh, made completely sense. So it's telling, okay, whatever you do, make sure it is, you know, yours, you feel that like this is what you have to do and do it, you know, with uh, excellence. So striving for excellence has also been an enormous motivation, you know, lo uh, uh, looking at uh, the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita to really feel that what am I, what I am doing, why I'm waking up every day makes sense and that I can, uh, you, uh, you know, continue on this path, feeling the motivation to do better and better every day in the context of something that is bigger than me. So my practice, personal practice of meditation every day helped me to find this uh, space inside that allowed the enough transformation and maybe a new 
condition inside to be able to understand better and better this very special book. And like many of these books, the, uh, you know, the more you read and the more you mature, the more you have changed and allow the change to happen inside, the more you start understanding, you know, the, the, the different layers. So this is how I have, uh, you know, uh, met the Bhagavad Gita. And, uh, uh, and, and the first two things that were really a capital turn in the, in, in the way I was uh, looking at life, looking at my purpose in life. So maybe if we want to open to some questions, I'll be happy to uh, go ahead and answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Ronit, for sharing your spiritual journey and your introduction to the Bhagavad Gita. It is an honor to have you with us today. But let us dive right into some questions. Our first question for you is, could you please elaborate on how meditation ties in with the Bhagavad Gita from the perspective of your pediatric experiences? Um, so meditation has everything to do with the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, this is actually one of the, um, the, the teachings that come later in uh, uh, you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita from uh, Lord Krishna. And uh, meditation is the key to understanding, you know, to get out of this confusion that the mind brings. So for me, uh, when you really come into a state of meditation, you're in touch with something that is wiser than your intellect. When we stay, you know, when you enter the Bhagavad Gita, we actually have access to the confusion in the intellect of Arjuna, which is usually where we are at, especially when we have to make a difficult choice. Our mind will bring all kinds of information that are, you know, relevant. They are very relevant. And then it brings confusion because it is relevant. So we don't know what is what. So to come back to something that's deeper, and for me, I call it the heart. You know, so that's where for me that the wisdom lies, you know, it is it is really the uh, deepest, the core of our being. If I, actually, if you look at, you know, the uh, tradition of the, our yoga, uh, we have all these five koshas, the layers and the inner one, the closer to the soul is called the Ananda Maya Kosha, you know, the, the layer of bliss. And if you are able to go closer to this, you get to this wisdom that is beyond ages. And I'm sure it is also, you know, closer to what, uh, uh, you know, Arjuna, uh, uh, Krishna tries to refer to at the beginning. So meditation brings you the wisdom to do a decision. It also brings you the wisdom to understand the Gita. And this is what uh, uh, Krishna talks about when he talks about, uh, uh, he talks about Raja Yoga, he talks about Buddhi Yoga, you know, so the, the understanding that this kind of yoga is uh, more important than even karma yoga or, uh, you know, the uh, yoga of uh, knowledge. So um, tying it to my experience as a, a pediatrician, uh, uh, you know, meditation has been a profound uh, tool uh, uh, for me to handle uh, not only the confusion that you have, you know, in life and especially in the stressful job as a, as a doctor, but also to uh, uh, be able to take the right decision and maybe be able to listen to people, you know, in a, in a better way and uh, understand them uh, better, maybe being more compassionate, open that space inside where they would feel also uh, a little more reassured, you know, uh, that children or parents. So we have a big role doctors and we need to be very uh, centered space. Thank you for sharing that Dr. Veronique. That was really insightful. Um, moving on to the next question. You've emphasized through your heartfulness practice that it is important to listen to our hearts when we make choices. How would you differentiate between leading with your heart versus getting conflicted by your emotions? Okay, so that's, that's, that's definitely a tough question. 
something that everybody would like to be able to answer, you know, uh, from the beginning, because that's what matters. Okay. And uh, uh, I, again, for my experience, this is something that comes with practice. Uh, with a, I think when we start, and again, you know, here, if we want to really look at the Bhagavad Gita, you can feel that, uh, you know, starting from a state of confusion, uh, you know, Arjuna kind of comes in a state of a flow where he's directly, you know, given by uh, Krishna the, the connection to understand, feel uh, what is the truth, what is reality. So, um, uh, this is where, uh, and, and again, you know, Lord Krishna himself tells, I'm in the heart of all being. So, for me to, uh, you know, feel that this is really happening in the heart and this is where i can be in touch reality with reality and if i have this practice so this is the practice of cleaning that we do in the evening uh, that allows me to remove you know slowly slowly day after day layers of uh, uh, um, you know this is i would say you know things that have come uh, that i have built up over the years and to get rid of it, you know, with this reality. So I'm not saying that, you know, you get to this very special vision that into uh, our Arjuna by Lord Krishna. That is a very, very, very different, you know, Arjuna was a special being at a special uh, place, but it does have something to do with that where from the heart, you kind of receive, you know, that the heart is an organ of feeling. Okay, and I, tr I really trust, and that's been really my case, not only in my life, but also as a doctor, you know, good doctors, they have the experience and they have this gut feeling about something. They know because of their experience and also because they allow, not this, but also, you know, this uh, uh, other um, instinct, you know, to tell you, you know, it could be this and that, but I think it's going to be that. And you also know, you know, that this is going to be the right thing. So when you find a doctor like this, you know, he usually uses his heart, you know, so he uses this instrument of feeling that actually guides us to something that is, that we are able to perceive. So for me, this is where, you know, uh, uh, the heart really helps to uh, understand the reality. So it needs practice. So we practice in the morning to be in touch with the heart, in the evening to remove this confusion of the mind. And slowly, slowly, we get to a clearer vision of, you know, being much more, more and more in touch with the heart directly. Yeah, does that answer your question? Absolutely perfect, thank you. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, some of those practices, I was wondering if we could expand on the last question. What were some of those practices that you do in the morning to help open the heart that you said? So in the morning, we do um, a simple meditation. And uh, uh, what I liked uh, is that there is no, there is nothing that attaches it to any religion. So uh, we do have people who practice from any kind of religion around. It's extremely simple. We just sit. We actually sit with another trainer, you know, that will help you as a new person to meditate because there's a, a usage of pranahuti, it's called transmission. And this allows, you know, it supports your transmission. It's like the catalyst to your meditation, uh, especially when you start. So when you start, you are asked to bring your attention to the heart with this idea that there's a source of light in your heart and why the light it's because it's the thing that is the lightest and the closest to uh what is indescribable so we are trying to be away from the senses so we can't really take an image that would keep us too much in the senses but we cannot our mind cannot meditate on nothing so we start with a supposition with something that is the closest to the lightest thing we can imagine with our mind. And that's a source of light. Okay, so, uh, and we try to go from thinking to feeling. Okay, so from 
getting that thought to start with. So this is dharana in you know Patanjali's yoga uh, uh, yoga. So dharana we focus on something and then dhyana we let go. The let go happens only with the feeling. The let go happens in the heart. If you try it, this is really where it happens. And then staying in your heart, we allow you know this organ of feeling to take more and more importance. So we are able to listen to it. And uh, we are able to also allow these qualities of the heart to grow. These are our human qualities. Our human qualities are compassion, uh, love, understanding, and these, they need to grow. And uh, uh, again, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, it starts with Karma Yoga, but it ends with love. And that was also something that was very dear to me because in my upbringing, love, you know, is also the heart is also the way of Christ. So I actually uh, felt like, oh, yes, I've been growing with these values. And uh, here again, I find them completely there in the Bhagavad Gita. So I, I do feel that, uh, you know, this Bhagavad Gita, uh, you know, some people might think that it is only for Indians. It is completely universal. The message is for all. It is for young people. I mean, young people have so much of choices to make. I, I know that this came at the right time for me. You know, this, the, the reading of the Bhagavad Gita, having access to Indian vision of the world, which was, uh, you know, keep bringing me an, a new opening to what, whatever I had been exposed to so far. And having a practice, you know, like this meditation practice in the morning that grinds me in something that is deeply me that is also beyond this life you know uh somehow even if you don't need to understand it just makes it you know uh it gives you that confidence also just one thing you know as a pediatrician i would like to say is that um i have observed that uh, small children uh, below the age of three they are completely in touch with their heart and how you feel it is in the way that they are, you know, they are spontaneous, they are in the moment, and they also are happy. I am not saying they're not crying, they, they are crying, but the moment that you change their mind and you divert, divert them, they're able to let go. So they have that capacity of, you know, bringing joy because they are in the present. And this is why we like to be with children. We like to be with children because they bring us back to being in touch with our heart. It's very easy with kids. So I was very fortunate to be a pediatrician because it's a very joyful, uh, you know, specialty in, in medicine. And um, and so when we grow, and this happens when we start having the ego that comes in the picture, it goes good, it's a tool, but we should, you know, and that's something that I've been striving to do with my own children, but also uh, we've seen in, you know, in. Well, it's also true in India, but in the way we educate uh, children, they should be able to stay in touch with their heart at all times. The heart is not something emotional and weak. It's something wise. Emotions is actually in the mind. So we should be careful not to, you know, mix all this. You know, the heart is actually something that is extremely strong. In French, cœur is for the heart. It's the same root as courage, you know. So, uh, so this courage comes from the heart. And when I've seen children growing, being in touch with the heart, they grow in, you know, into being people that are young adults that are so confident. They know what they want to do and what they want, don't want to do. They are kind of, you know, this, these values uh, from the heart are interweaved. They are, they are part of their own beings. And because of that, they are able to navigate through life and through choices with a compass being the heart. So this meditation practice allows you, you know, we start with children with a relaxation, simple relaxation that brings to the heart. Uh, it allows you to always be in touch with your heart. So that's what we do in the morning. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, on the previous question, you also touched upon yoga. Uh, in that aspect, we did have a question. Could you please describe the differences between the physical yoga asanas and the yoga Lord Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita? 
Yes. So that's that's definitely part of something that I I like teaching because I I I had to learn. You know, I had to understand how is this related, and um, so uh, so we we teach uh, yoga. We train yoga teachers, and it's very important, especially for Westerners. I would say to understand that yoga stems from the teachings of Lord Krishna. Okay, so if you understand what, if you really want to understand what yoga is, you have to read the Bhagavad Gita because this is what yoga is. Yoga is about union, you know, being aligned, being in tuned with the core of your being, your inner being and beyond, it means the universe. And this is what Arjuna is learning on the battlefield because at that moment of crisis he needs to know it's very important so crisis usually happen for us to change so it's you know it's important i mean it's nice to take it as a as a possibility for change so now when why has it become asanas well i don't i'm not going to give you a, a you know a course on that but um uh, so if we come a little later in the age you know, of uh, patanjali uh, yoga he talks about asana but the way Patanjali talks about asana is, you know, being able to uh, sit uh, in a steady and comfortable posture so that you can meditate. So now you have to imagine, you know, those sages, they were meditating for hours, you know, like hours in the day and day after day after day. If you do that, you'll have no muscles, your organs will not be working, your, you know, your body will not work. So what they did is they invented a system of us that would still take care of their body, making sure that the body function was working and uh, take care of the uh, physical part. We also, we have to take care of all the layers, okay? The physical, the energetical, the mental, uh, the wisdom, you know, everything needs to be uh, taken care of. That's also yoga. So the physical is important. It has evolved in a practice that uh, allows the body to stay supple and fit so that we can sit for meditation. So the purpose of asana is to bring health and to bring, you know, uh, also, it's also part of a cleansing purpose. You know, it allows to remove some blockages, uh, emotional, energetical blockages. Releasing that allows you to be more in touch also with your inner self. So, you know, it might be looking distant, but if you look at bringing it together, if you practice yoga as it is taught by Patanjali, you will practice your asanas with a completely different purpose, knowing that your body is also sacred and through the body, you can reach something that is what, you know, uh, afterwards we can we can find on, you know, in the Bhagavad Gita uh, as a, the, this uh, vision, you know, that this, understanding this clarity of our higher nature, our higher purpose. So it has a place. It has also a very good place uh, in uh, therapeutic yoga. I'm very much interested in, you know, looking at that to help people to uh, be first, you know, maybe it's not easy for people to uh, meditate immediately. Some people need to be first uh, um, understanding their body and, you know, the different uh, possibilities that their body has before they can go to further, you know, uh, further understanding of the, the beautiful depths of uh, what we're made of. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing that and for sharing all your answers to these questions. They're very insightful, so thank you. Uh, and thank you we would much. like to pass it back. Yes, and we would like to pass it back to our co-host to conclude the session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me.